What's up, Mets fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Mets Sub Podcast. We've got a very awesome interview for you guys today. We talked to Mark DeRosa all the way back in September. It was, it was a few months ago, definitely, but it's finally coming out now. Manager of Team USA in the WBC World Baseball Classic starting this weekend. We're excited for you guys to hear. James, what do you, you think about the, the interview with DeRosa? I mean, you got to rack my brain a little bit, but I do remember having a lot of fun with Mark DeRosa, and I think we were, interviewed him right on those couches at MLB Central, correct? Yes, we were we were right on the stage. We were looking fancy, all professional. We honestly, we haven't seen this video in like two months, three months. Yeah. <laughs> more, my, 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 way more than two months. Two months ago was January. You forget. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> Baseball season is here. Yeah. So, again, interview from a while ago, but we thought it'd be timely to hold on to it for right before the World Baseball Classic started because, as Mark said, Mark DeRosa is the manager for Team USA. We also talked about things like Mark's upbringing, playing baseball in New Jersey growing up, his career how he saw the Mets as a road player when he was a member of the Braves for a long time, and then some other things that, you, you know, we just had to cut out because it wasn't timely anymore. Yeah, shout out to Vito for doing a fantastic job on the edit. We're excited for you guys to listen to this interview. So much more content coming at you. We're going to drop a spring training episode a little bit later this week so we can round up what's going on there in, you know, Florida with the Mets, as well as some interviews with guys like Tyler McGill, Drew Smith, David Peterson, Joey Lucchese, uh, Dan Vogelback, Keith Rad, the new radio voice for the New York Mets, and a lot more. So make sure you guys are following us on all our social media so you can stay up to date when those episodes drop, as well as make sure you're following and subscribing to our podcast feed, Mets Up on Twitter, on, nope, not Twitter, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever it is. Drop a rating, download, subscribe, and uh, enjoy the Mark DeRosa interview. Get up, get, get up, get up. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another bonus episode of the Mets Up Podcast. We're sitting here today with former big leaguer, MLB Central host, coach of Team USA, Mark DeRosa. Mark, thank you so much for coming out and talking oh, to thanks us. For well, having actually, me. we came out yeah, we to <laughs> talk to you. I think we would say. Thank you for having us. No, crushed red velvet. Here we go, right? We go. <laughs> so we wanted to start off with some, well, we know you're a New Jersey guy, some icebreakers. For okay. You. So the first one is going to be pork roll or Taylor Ham. Yeah, for me, it's Taylor Ham. Of course. That's I, right I, 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 I've been in this argument. I think... South Jersey, like I've talked to Todd Frazier about this. I've had different guys. Mike Trapp, the, this, the further south and closer you get to Philly, it turns into pork roll. But yeah, for sure. me, it's Taylor Ham. It's good. Yeah, that's two. Uh, next one, Jets or Giants? Cowboys. Wow. Oh, no, Cowboys. We were asking about football stuff too, but I guess not. Anymore. Shared a room <laughs> with an old, my brother was six years older than me. I shared, it, shared a room with him. My dad was a huge giant guy. He wanted to be a pain in the neck. Oh, okay. So he went He went the other way. Oh Thank goodness. God he didn't go Redskins or now it's Commanders yeah, or Eagles. He went Cowboys. So like in my room, I grew up knowing the star. Were you young enough to be able to actually enjoy any Cowboys success? I, I write in my pocket. I took a lot on the chin in grammar school because the Giants were animals yeah. back then. Mark Bavaro, Phil Sims, but then right in that 92, 93, yeah. that was right when I was like 16, 17 That's years awesome. old. Good Trey time. Aikman it's a good was, yeah, was my guy. All right, Garden State Parkway or New Jersey Turnpike? Yeah, I'm a Turnpike guy, 16W. We were talking about that earlier. On yeah. our drive here, I'm a Turnpike guy too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Garden State Parkway is useful. You got to use it. It's a guy you like utility, but it does take the drive last. <laughs> this, this is the last one. This is follow up. This one's for our producer, John, over here. Does Central Jersey exist? No, not, no. not, not, nice. Yeah, <laughs> nice. not really. You're either in Bergen County or you're down the shore. There's no in between. All right, we're not from my we're world. We're from Westfield Union County. So will we be South Jersey to you? Yeah. All right. I'll go with that. That's crazy. Oh, that's, yeah. I can't have that. I'm about to kill the podcast. Not, not. No. Yeah. For me, I, I didn't venture much further outside of uh, Bergen County until, uh, until I went to college. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. So now to switch the conversation to baseball. And we thought this is topical too, because we saw you, Started a game at every position except center field, catcher, and pitcher. And, pitcher. and, pitch. and now with the Rawlings Gold Glove Award, they're adding a utility player to it. So we had this conversation Daily. like, do <laughs> no, you sure. do you like being called a utility player? Like as a player, was that something that was okay? How was it viewed? You know, when I first came into the league, you didn't want to be called that. Uh, I was also honest with myself that. I shouldn't have been a starter. Like Rafael Fercal burst on a scene with the Atlanta Braves and won the rookie of the year. I'll never forget being on the backfield. I thought I was the next shortstop of the Atlanta Braves. Walt Weiss was on the way out and you know, it was mine. I was going to take it. And then I took ground balls with Fercal. Right. I called my dad that day and I was like, uh -uh. <laughs> we're going to have to rethink some things. And Bobby Cox was just honest with me. He's like, you can go down to AAA and play shortstop all you want. 
or we could start bouncing you around. So that's what that's what I, I did. I, I grew to actually enjoy it and never in a million years did I think like the goal was still always to play every day yeah. at one position. But I think it started to it started to change for me as as uh, Buck found ways in Texas to get me at bats. Actually, I, a funny story: the last game of the season in two thousand six, I believe, Buck did call me in the office and ask me if I wanted to do all nine. Oh wow! Okay. Every yeah. inning try. Yeah. And my answer was, and I don't know if I would would have changed it. I said, name me somebody of importance that's ever done that. Yeah, it's a good. It's a good point. I said I don't kind of want to be a hokey little thing. That's kind of interesting because I feel like now utility positions change a lot. Oh, Baseball. it's huge. Like, it's become something now. You more question the Rollins ball gloves. It's become something of like an enviable job. And we have two guys on the Mets who've been two of the best utility men in baseball between Jeff McNeil and Luis Guillorme. And even inside the team, they do it differently. So, kind of playing off what you said, your answer to Buck and what these guys mean to the Mets. Like, what does being utility men mean in the modern game? How has it changed? I think I think for me it's knowing knowing your role. I think it's falling in love with being kind of a gun for hire, understanding you're giving a guy a day off his feet. Um, I I just I fell in love with it. I when in Glenn Hubbard was was my first base coach with the Atlanta Braves. He used to say, "Dero, when in doubt, be an athlete." And and I used to always say like. I didn't know how to play baseball or know how to hit until I was like 30 years old. Like I literally just willed it and athleted it and, and, and tried to, it, it wasn't going to look pretty in the outfield. Just, just catch it. Yeah. Like and that, that why I used, the only place I felt comfortable was shortstop. And I knew I was never going to really play there ever again. Yeah. So it was time to be on, be okay with being uncomfortable. That's fair. So you talked about, you know, playing with Buck. Yeah, and obviously we're a Mets podcast, so we got to ask you, what was the experience like? You know, playing under Buck Showalter. I, I I loved everything about the way Buck went about it. Um, maniacal in his preparation. I mean, down to like asking us if we liked the carpet in the clubhouse. It really? <laughs> yeah, asking us if we wanted Sunday sweatsuits for for eating, so <laughs> uh, uh, or travel if we all wanted to, to dress. He was on top of of every little thing we practice plays that would probably pop up once or twice in the entire season but he wanted to know that we were prepared for it but also quick wit humor um i I was i was into what he was selling and he gave me a chance he gave me a chance to play every day so he holds a a, a, he believed in me that's big yeah like um so he he holds a special place i went actually when, when I got named a manager for Team USA, he was one of the first calls I made. And, and two weeks ago, I went in and kind of shadowed him. It's cool. And uh, I wanted to get in the weeds. He wasn't giving me any of the Mets secrets. I'm like, no. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, give me like how you handle a bullpen, how you second and third, what, 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 your, what your philosophies on all these different things. He's like, I'm not giving you all of that. <laughs> Just kind of through osmosis, pick up on a few things. So yeah, I enjoyed my time playing for him. From shadowing him, did you notice anything different than you remember about him? No, nothing. On Even top talking of everything, about the analytics guy comes in, check. Nutritionist, check. Trainer, check. He, he's got his hands in everything. And that's how, you know, if, if done right, I think that's how it should be. You know, I think, I think in today's game, the players are so much more knowledgeable on who they are and why they're there and how what makes them successful that I think you've got to have your hand in... in uh, in a myriad of different positions throughout the course of uh, the organization from from the PR to the analytics department but then you can't lose that human element side so so that's that's the biggest thing for me that bl- that blend you mentioned the big unit that I shipped away from the Mets we d- saw that was your first ever major league baseball play yeah. against, against Randy Johnson <laughs> as a pinch hitter for Greg Maddox yes so can you walk us through Sunday young night baseball? You, really, you walk us through young Mark DeRosa's mind when you're stepping up to the plate against the unit. Well, young Mark DeRosa never thought he was getting called up at that point. <laughs> um, 1998, getting dressed in Zebulon, North Carolina, after a double A game. That's a real place, right? Yeah, <laughs> playing a Mudcats, wearing a double wide. Mudcats still around. Yeah, yeah double wide trailer that kind of was our visiting clubhouse, and and ended up getting told I was going to the big leagues by. 
just an awesome one of my awesome minor league managers, Randy Engel, and and calling home and telling my dad, and he was like, "You're not ready." <laughs> that was his first line. "You're not ready." I said, "Well, I'm not ready, but I'm going." Um, didn't have a helmet. My bats hadn't come up yet; hadn't been shipped up yet. I just remember shake, wondering if people could see me, sh my legs shaking. That was first. <laughs> I was like, "Man, you gotta stop shaking." And second, thinking like, well, this is kind of perfect because no one expects me to get a hit here. <laughs> this is like win-win, right? So I'm point. just gonna it's let it go. Already. I'm just gonna let it go. And I, I, I remember fouling one back. <laughs> I remember it. fouling one back and stepping out and going, man, I think I might be on him. Like maybe I'm on him. And then he threw me a nasty slider in the dirt that got away from the catcher. I swung and missed and. And I'm running down to first base going, oh my God, Jeff Bagwell. So like, it, I was like, I was being a fan more so than realizing that I actually was playing in the game. And uh, when I came off, it took me that month of September. I got three at bats. I went one for three. Um, it took me that month to get over being like, not intimidated. I wasn't. I was just in awe of like being there, yeah. especially with the Braves at that time. It was like, you're on the plane and, and you're surrounded by Hall of Famers so, with the expectation of we win two out of three, three out of four every series we go into, which helped me as I moved on in my career. But just being in awe every year, it was like, who's coming to spring? Gary Sheffield, it's got, it's got traded <laughs> over. It, it was somebody, every, Andre Scalaraga. There was just star Thank after you. star walking through that clubhouse that it took a second. Yeah. Who would you say in your career had, outside of Randy Johnson, since we just spoke about him, any other pitcher that you were like, wow, I can't believe I'm facing him? I remember Roger Clemens in spring training was always a treat. Spring training? Yeah, because Simi, I never faced him in a regular season. I did all those guys that I grew up, Mike Mussina, um, Andy Pettit, um, just kind of watching these guys' careers. Any, any non-Yankees? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I faced Tom Glavin when he came back, to, came over to the Mets. That was kind of surreal to see him go over to the Metsies and then, and then have to face him, but yeah, the guys that, that, that were there before before I actually came up. The guys that I, you know, my generation, I just, I, I was in awe of certain guys being so talented. Yeah. I remember the first time facing Justin Verlander in Comerica, Sunday day game, him throwing the first pitch and being like, oh my God, I didn't see that. <laughs> you know, like that. that. Yeah. Or Steven Strasburg in 2012, in a sim game on a backfield in in in, uh, in spring training with the Washington Nationals, and the entire organization is standing behind a, by a screen watching. I'm like, I'll, I'll I'll throw my hat in the ring, and it was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> like, those are that's some of the stuff that I remember, but you know, for the most part, I I, I felt good in the box. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating to hear you talk about your career because you spanned. So many years, like being able to yeah. say, I faced against a Verlander and a Strasburg, also faced against a Clemens, a Pettit, mm -hmm. a Johnson. Just like, kind of like- End of the 90s all the baseball. way until, yeah, 2013. And the game, the game, it, ha it has, it's evolved, it's changed. Uh, I don't know if good, bad, and different. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll go with good because it's it's the way they want to play it. And I'm, I'm there for it. I see it, I have a 12 year old son. I see the way he, he gets his content, it's completely different than the yeah, way yeah. I did. So right it's here. either, yeah, <laughs> it's either buy in or, or, or get left behind. What do you think the biggest change you see in the game, either from when you play to now, or even the just pitching. over the course of your career? Yeah, what, what about the pitching? The, the sheer velocity, the stuff these guys have, the way they train. Um, you you don't see fours and fives in rotations featuring 81 and 92. It's true, with, yeah. With, 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 you know, decent breaking yeah. ball, I mean, that's where we had to feast, right? Yeah. They don't feast on anything. I mean, there's guys I've never heard of coming out of bullpens. I sit there last night and watch a Dodgers game versus Arizona as I'm closing my eyes and Arizona's bringing out a reliever that I haven't heard of and he's sitting 98 with a split falling off the table. <laughs> like we didn't have, we didn't have, that was, 
That was Billy Wagner. That was like, that was your closer. That was Benitez coming in. Like, that's who, yeah. who you saw, and they're seeing him just run through the game. So that's the biggest thing for me would be the pitching. And then the way this shift has impacted the game. We shifted Barry Bonds. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. I remember playing short right field in what was called Pac Bell at the time. What's it now? Oracle, I think. Yeah. Oracle. Um, it was AT&T in between. Yeah. yeah. He was the only guy we really shifted. Yeah, you take two steps right or left. I remember, I'm, I remember like, oh, you don't want the, the, the team to see you moving. So the way we went about it, I don't know if it was Cal Ripken who I read this. He would be like, Turn around and tell your outfield how many outs and then slowly veer two steps to your mm. right or two steps to your left so they don't pick up on it. See, that now it's like... That's, a, that's funny to think about, like, picking up on it. Because yeah. now, like you said, they're, they'll just leave the entire side of the field open. So there's no hits on the ground for a lot of guys. And then you're facing guys that are throwing 98 with, with nasty stuff. So it's like the strikeouts are going to be up. But with the new rules, I do hope... I hope, because you don't know until yeah. it's instituted, that we get back to more of uh, more of like what the Mets have and what I still think the great lineups. There's a flow to it. Yeah, no, no, sure. Know thy role, right? M me hitting two twenty with twenty four homers is really not impacting us in the six seven hole. But if I if I'm my on base is three eighty and and I'm I'm constantly teeing the Pete Alonzos of the world up and giving them a chance to drive in runs. We're going to be better for it. Definitely. That's kind of one of the most beautiful things about this Mets team. Because even though they do play in like one of the biggest ballparks in this one, the hardest ones to hit the ball out, it seems like they found a way to kind of you know, counteract that. Yeah. But talking about the park, you mentioned coming and playing against Tom Glad and that a couple times feeling weird. What was it like for you to visit Queens, the Mets, as a visitor? Mm -hmm. Shea Stadium, City Field later on. Well, how would you, yeah, well, I always how felt you felt I was that good well, experience? I always felt I was at home because the deli meat was different. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was yeah. better. The bread. <laughs> Everything was different. I knew my family was coming. I knew we were going to go to dinner in the city. So could grab some Italian somewhere amazing. Um, so I always felt super comfortable in Shea Stadium. Yeah. And the infield left a little to be desired. And there's a couple <laughs> bad hops out there. But I thought it played small. It carried. I still say... Um, to go to to go to City Field now, I think is one of the best fan experiences for me. It's easy in, easy out. The place is awesome. The food's yeah. awesome. Like I, I just I just enjoy going to City Field. But yeah, Shea Stadium was was just an easy place for me to come feel comfortable. And I mean, I had 30, 40 people there every time, so that was always huge. Yeah. You talked about coaching Team USA in the World Baseball Classic coming up. How excited are you for that event to be? Back? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm I'm not allowing myself to think about it all day long for the next <laughs> six months. I, 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 but that's the way Just my that, that, that's the way my brain brain cooks a little bit. Um, I pick my spots with it. Honored, humbled, blown away with the opportunity so looking forward to it but also not going in like happy to be there i'm yeah, going yeah. to want to win the thing and uh want to create an environment that these guys walk away saying hey dero knows his stuff and had us on lock and because at the end of the day it's about that it's yeah. not like i'm going to make these grandiose managerial moves <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the pitchers are going to be on strict pitch counts. Hit and run. Not going to, not going to really hit and run with many people. I maybe. I mean, I'm sure I'm going to want to put guys in motion, but it's going to be predicated on how they feel at that time. Yeah. I know in in 2009 when, when I did it. I mean, I attacked it differently because I was a utility guy. Whatever you need, Skip. But Derek Jeter and David Wright handled it a little bit differently. <laughs> so I, I completely understand that. So if, if if Mike Trout wants to do a certain thing and Mike Trout's going to do that certain thing yeah. so I'm sure with Bryce Harper and Goldschmidt and on down the line I was going to ask you to preview the team but then you just mentioned David Wright so if you talk about it we're a Mets podcast so yeah. it's kind of like a rule someone mentions David Wright and you have to talk about David Wright more but can you mention any interactions David, 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 yeah, I, I, uh, Captain America Captain America 2009 WBC getting a chance to be in a locker room with him well first off he's a better human being than he was a player and that's hard that's hard because he was a just unbelievable, Pretty good. <laughs> unbelievable player. 
And he's the only guy I always I always used to ask him like he always swiveled his hips when he hit. I've never really seen anyone really do that. Um, I just remember his walk off knock. I'll take you behind the scenes. 2009 WBC LA. My wife and daughter at the time come out. My daughter's whew, 2009. She's six. Knock on the door in the hotel room. He had gone to get muffins, muffins and, and coffee for himself <laughs> and whoever. And he saw that I had my family there, and he's like, "I figured your daughter would want some oh, wow. muffins with awesome. you know cookies, sugar." And I, I he closed the door. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> how, "How nice is that, right?" <laughs> And then he gets the walk-off knock against Puerto Rico, and we that's where we became a team. Because it's a feeling out process, I'm sure, for a lot of guys. Like, who's the alpha male in the room? Because at the end of the day, it, the team is a little league team, right? I always <laughs> take it back to that. You know who the best player is. You know who yeah, we're like, kind of like carrying. Yeah. And you try and create an atmosphere where everyone kind of falls in line, knows their role. And I always felt like for the WBC, it's like, if you can eliminate that super quick and create more of a chemistry in the, in, in, the, in the locker room, you're better off. I felt like that broke the ice for us. We fell in love with each other after that knock. We were going nuts. He was going nuts. So, yeah, anytime I get a chance to see him, I, I don't see him much. I remember hanging with him at Ryan Zimmerman. I'm dating myself. Ryan <laughs> Zimmerman's wedding. Wow. Oh, wow. That's, good invite. Yeah, good invite. <laughs> solid, solid guest list, but getting a chance to see him there was awesome. And then uh, occasionally run into him. Yeah. But, yeah. Imagine he's busy. But if he wants to come walk through and talk to the, to the boys. Yeah, just, I mean, you're going to be talking about us too, right? Yeah. I mean, it's more than welcome. <laughs> Let him know the mess up podcast. Yeah. I, I missed him at, a, at like, a, like a New York, New Jersey bar, in, like out in uh, Santa Monica, staying with friends over the spring during March Madness. And I was wearing my Mets hat. Some guy was like, oh, are you a Mets fan? I was like, yeah. He goes, you yeah, missed David Wright by a half hour. I almost fell over. <laughs> I was going to start crying. I was so upset about it. It's like, that's like, it's like my hero. But, yeah. yeah. Well, you also played with Albert Pujols for a season. Yeah. It can, like, can you believe that he's still doing Like, how great has he no. been this year? How nuts is that? I say this. He's, he's the greatest, greatest hitter I ever had a chance to share a locker room with. Um, his preparation. That kind of like... I, Sometimes it gets overblown for certain guys. Like, oh, no one works harder than him. We all work hard. Yeah. Like, there yeah. are a few guys that are a little bit lazier than others, but for the most part. But I cannot lie. Every time I got to the clubhouse, this dude was full dripping sweat in the <laughs> cage, perfecting. He knew how much he meant to our team, the fans, the game. Like, I don't know that weight. I just always used to say, I'm going to show up. Six guys ever. I'm going to bust my ass for four ABs. I'm going to play as good a defense as I can possibly play. I'm going to try and put my little sliver in there and help us win games. And he had, he was carrying a franchise and he was well aware of it. So I always I go back to this story when I got traded there in, in end of June. Right, mid-July, we're in Cincinnati. It's one of our first road trips that I'm a part of the team. We're losing by three. He, It's the eighth inning, top of the eighth, and we're warming up our closer. Bases loaded. We're losing by three. We're warming up our closer. Bases loaded, and the entire dugout's like, he's going grand slam. <laughs> we're bringing our closer in, and that's the way this guy hits. This is the way this guy rolls. And he did, and we did. And I can tell stories about pools being in spring training, not knowing who he was. And I'm, I was playing third and I'm kicking the dirt even with the bag. And Jose Okendo was the third base coach. And he's like, hey, psst, back up. <laughs> and no one knew Albert at the time. He hadn't been in big leagues. And I'm like, man, come on. You know, cause you're always like, will he bond? Yeah. If he, yeah. I mean, he wasn't what he lives now. He was, you felt and, and thin. And I'm like, the, wor the worst thing in the world for me trying to make a team as if a guy lays a bunt down and Bobby, like, I don't make a play on it. Yeah. So I was like, kind of, he's like, no, 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 no. Back up. He could <laughs> kill you. And he ended up Disney, like hitting a clock <laughs> and then went on to be unbelievable. We had one of our, like, come, like, come to realization moments. When we first got this gig, we started hanging on the field, batting practice. One of our first series that we worked was Mets Cardinals. And he just like walked by I think each of us like almost like fell over. Like you feel your knees buckle. I only have, I didn't green fly. 
anybody really in the big leagues while I played. Um, I didn't ask for a ton of autographs if I, if I went back. I don't think I'd do it differently, although there are some that I want, but he was one. My son has two jerseys in his room. He's got Buster Posey. Yeah. That's a good guy, too. And, and Albert Pujols. Yeah, get him a DeRosa. <laughs> yeah, but um, he can work on his own. <laughs> but those were the two guys that, that I played with that uh, were game. I mean, obviously, Chip, for the Atlanta Braves, Chipper Jones, like, really impacted. Like, on, on, on one hand, the guys who impacted my career the most, he would be, be on there just the way he, I shared a locker next to him for six years and watched him have to, again, carry a franchise and, and kind of the power and the weight that that comes with that. Yeah, Tripper Jones is like the first Met villain. Oh, yeah. I can remember. And he loved it. Didn't he name his kid Shea? He named his kid Shea, named his kid Shea like, but he had yeah, a Larry. respect for it. Yeah, Larry. Yeah. But I, he, embraced, he embraced it. But I'll tell you, it's kind of behind the scenes, I couldn't get him out in new york like i'd be like come on let's go to dinner oh, let's go. Yeah. he's, like, he's yeah. like i can't yeah he's like, <laughs> <"This> a smart <laughs> guy <Yeah. laughs> it was a murder oh man a couple questions left here because we barely had you for like almost a half hour nah, that's incredible right. but um play a lot of different teams in your career and you mostly held consistent with the number seven is there anything yeah. against that number no actually um i was 16 playing college football joe montana <laughs> Six foot one, no, you know, limited mobility. I always prided myself on trying to be like him. Um, so I was 16 with the Braves when I first came up. And when I got, got picked up by the Texas Rangers, Eric Young, the now first base coach of the, of the Braves, yep. EY, shiggy, shiggy, quack, quack. That's what he used to say. When <laughs> slam his cards down. I ended up playing with him. But playing what? Playing what? Texas. He, oh, oh when we were playing like whatever, you know, yeah. dealer's choice on the plane. And uh, when I got to Texas, I was like, what's open? And they said, you know, it's funny, seven just came open. I said, seven, I'm Mickey man, I'll give me that. Yeah. I'm on that. And then I was able to hold it. Yeah, it's pretty good. The Very whole good. way until my last year, Jose Reyes ah. came up to me and goes, Poppy, <laughs> I gotta wear it. And I was like, and I had more time than him, but I, you know. I was yeah. like, Jose, he's like, you want it? I'm like, I don't want a thing. You no, got I didn't it. Take I didn't take anything. Wow, good teammate. And I took 16 nice. back. So I went 16, 7, 16 at the end. It's pretty good. Nice. Did Jose give you anything? No. <laughs> Come on. I was hanging on at that point. Yeah. You could have it. All right, well, I think that's probably time for us to wrap it up. Or do you have one more? I want one more. All right, give give it, go one more. Go one more. You just mentioned about college football. Like, I think most listeners won't really know that you were – Prominent college quarterback, yeah. Penn. What was it like making that decision between football <laughs> yeah. and baseball, and even just going through like a, a recruiting process? I wasn't prepared to give up either coming out of high school, and that's why I went to the yeah. Ivy League. Um, and the academics. Well, yeah, obviously, <laughs> yeah. You put put yourself again in the most uncomfortable positions you can put yourself in, and hopefully it works out. But that that was the big appeal. I had a couple, you know, scholarships for football coming out. Not many for baseball at all. Um, Go figure. And I, yeah, yeah up here, <laughs> you got to be something. And uh, I just, I didn't want to give baseball up. Uh, my dad didn't want me to give it up. He's like, Good gut feeling. yeah, he was just like, keep going with it. So that's, I went to Ivy League, ended up playing uh, two years there. And, and I think it, it helped me in my career because... The ability to command the huddle, the ability of, of 11 guys having to do their jobs in order for these, for your that play to be successful or it gets blown up. That, that's where I kind of like get my kind of clubhouse eh, chemistry wise, try and be more of that. And then I also use it as a mental toughness. I know that good 75% of these guys that I battled against in the minor leagues never had to do two a days. Yeah. Never had to get smoked by a coach with a whistle over the top of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I always use that like I can out tough them. Yeah. Um, you mentioned being an athlete too early in your career. And going yeah. back and going back to that. Yeah. So I, I, God, six foot four. I don't even know if baseball's in, I just, <laughs> you know, my thing, football was controllable. Yes. I never woke up and just was going to throw ducks that day. If you could throw a spiral, you could throw a spiral. If you can read a defense, you pretty much can read a defense, at least on that level, yeah. the high school, college level. 
Like, I get it. They're exotic in the NFL. Yeah. But I felt like I, I was going to play well. Baseball, you could do everything right and go home 0 for 4, and that drove me crazy. Like, I couldn't control it. So that, that was the appeal to football, especially up here, high school-wise. Oh, you're they don't, Catholic, they right? don't walk yeah. around going, hey, that guy's an awesome third baseman. Yeah. <laughs> you know? The guy behind center. <laughs> yeah, they're like, that guy plays quarterback at, at a good height. You know? yeah. So the appeal was there. Awesome. Yeah. I think I don't, we don't want to rush you. No. We could talk for hours, yeah, but great. I know you're busy today. Thank you so much for coming no, on the podcast. Me. We really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we can talk soon again. Absolutely.